Great. Thanks, Frank. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, just wanted to first start out with a uh, little bit of background on me uh, before we get things going. So I've uh, been in the technology game for, uh, well, let's just say just a, just a little over 15 years. So I've, I've seen, uh, seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I think uh, hopefully I bring a little bit of perspective to, to our conversation now. Uh, around the digital workplace, so I think uh, uh, our opinion, my opinion, is that we we are in definitely in a flexion point and and, uh, and have uh, interesting opportunities and challenges ahead of us. So a bit of background on me: I started back in the which were the big six days in professional services for uh, with KPMG and Ernst and Young, and in that uh, realm, we were applying technology uh, in the realm of financial planning to uh, organizations such as banks, brokerage firms, wealth management firms, to basically provide uh, financial planning to their firms. So a different application of technology. Uh, the next stop for me was a software startup around portfolio and financial planning, again, focused in the financial realm. And then I uh, went off and uh, did my own thing in the internet startup. Uh, Using a uh, building an online political prediction market, so using the wisdom of crowds concept uh, to uh, to disrupt the uh, the existing way that uh, polling was was done in the political world. Then I arrived in the uh, content and collaboration space, uh, working with SharePoint and BI for uh, for just about the last five or six years or so, and uh, that that's obviously what we do now here at Portal Solutions. And uh, you know, a couple of things and observations along the way for me is, you know, I've really been fascinated with the way technology can be used to spread knowledge and enable informed decisions. And in particularly now, focus on uh, this notion of the digital workplace and how that can truly transform organizations and, and you know, at the end of the day, really make employees, you know, happier, more engaged, more productive. Um, I think that's we probably would all agree that that's that's a that's a, uh, a, a, a reasonable objective to uh, to attain. So I've seen a lot of hype along the the way, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit from that perspective. And and frankly, coming into this world of the digital workplace with a bit of skepticism, uh, but I think uh, you know based on what I've seen and our experiences with our clients, the uh, you know we think there's there's reason for optimism, and, and we're living in a pretty exciting time. So when we talk about beyond Rick, intranets. I apologize for the interruption. Uh, a couple of folks have mentioned that they're having a little difficulty hearing you and asked that you would please speak up or speak more directly into the microphone. Okay. Uh, how about now? Is this any better, Frank? Uh, you sound better to me. Thank okay. you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, beyond intranets, the digital workplace. So. So what we're really talking about here is, 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 and at its core, is competition and competitive differentiation, right? So that can be competition for people and talent, uh, and then obviously competition for customers. So there's, there's lots of disruptive forces in, in every industry that you can point to, and a big part of what we're going to talk about today is, is, is how do you make your organization more adaptive to change using the tools and the processes and the things that we're going to talk about today that we're calling the digital workplace. So we'll start with what's going on in the consumer space from a technology perspective and then look at what lessons can be gleaned uh, that can be applied to, to organizations and applied specifically to our, our conversation today. So just in the spirit of disruption, just a couple of uh, uh, food for thought around that. A couple of recent developments that, that kind of drive the point home. So, if you look at the organization uh, BlackBerry, their market cap in 2009 was over 80 billion dollars, and four years later, today, that market cap has dropped by down to three billion dollars, and they're at a point now where they basically can't even sell themselves. So, you think about it. There was no major financial malfeasance or anything else other than pure competition in the marketplace where a company could go from that size and a market leader down to basically uh, not 95% uh, value of, of the company. So during that same time, obviously Apple shares 
gains, you know, something on the order of 300 percent. So, you know, disruption is very real, and and uh, and and it's not just something that's reserved for just the consumer technology space. Okay, so let's move on and talk a little bit about if we're going to talk about consumers. What I thought I'd do is talk a notion of well, I'm the consumer and I have a bunch of tools. So let's let's kind of start the conversation there. So. I did a quick inventory of, of all the tools and technology that it, we have just in our household. So starting with me, a Windows phone, which, uh, which I got for the low, low price of $49 uh, earlier this year when I renewed with Verizon. So that was pretty cool. What I gave up was a lot of the cool apps that I had on the iPhone that I have. But I've got an iPad as well, so now I still have all my apps. So for reading, there's three Kindle Fires for the kids. There's another Kindle Reader for me. Three more iPhones for the kids. An iPhone for the wife. Yes, a Slate computer for the wife. My work computer. The kids' school computer. And of course, the, uh, the must-have device, which is the Xbox. And finally, Apple TV. So the point of this is not, you know, how cool is Rick with all his gadgets. There's a few things of notes. When you look at the screen, you think, my God, that's a that's a that's a bloody mess, right? But the things that the the thing are, are takeaways here is number one, all these devices are connected. They're all connected to the internet. So as you think about cloud-based services being provisioned and so forth, all those services are now accessible through multiple device. So when you think about your organization and the consideration of cloud, that's where you really get the, the, nice, the, the, the ability to, to make use of all these devices and have them work together. The other is just a cost and performance. So you know the latest versions of every one of these devices has more features and costs less. The other gets to user experience, right? So there's an intuitive app-like user interface for everything from the gaming system down to your tablet and your phone and your computer. So you're seeing more of, of this intuitive app-like interface across all these devices. So implication for organizations, user experience, usability, right? The other is zero training. It didn't require any training uh, you know, for, for Facebook to get up to a billion users. And the other is part parcel of that is rapid adoption. And then finally, all of these things were built separately for, for specific purposes. But again, they all have consistent user interfaces, so that's where you get the usability and the adoption. So lessons learned for, uh, you know, for as you look to adopt technology within your organization. So final point on this, and, and what's kind of remarkable to me as I was putting this, this slide together, is, is really how well all these devices work together. When you look at that slide, you think that you know, it would just be a, a complete pain. But when you think about, you know, a perfect example is a book I just recently purchased. And I, I can, of all those devices, I can read this book on every single one of them except for two, which are the gaming systems. So in each one of those, every time I log into the device, it takes me to the very last page I read on a separate device. It shows all the highlights and notes that I captured and syncs everything across all those devices. So a real good, you know, quick example of, of in practice, you know, how you can do multiple devices and share content uh, just as a quick uh, consumer example. And uh, actually, it's a great book, by the way. So you get one book recommendation as part of the webinar. Okay, so staying on the uh, the um, uh, disruption scene. So, you know, if you think about, you know, all this great stuff's happening in the consumer space, you know, how disruptive is this, and, and you know, what are what are some of the lessons that uh, that we can take from this? And I think it's always useful to look for kind of inflection points, right? So, if you look at, you know, the fate of record stores and bookstores and now movie rentals with, uh, you know, blockbuster. Who knew they still had 300 stores, but apparently they do. They're now shutting down at the uh, first of the year. So if you look at all this disruption, and, and just recently back in August, this headline appeared in the Wall Street Journal, so smartphones are now outselling feature phones. Uh, so that's the first time that that inflection point has hit. So the implications for you, 
uh, obviously are, if you look at the dev demographics, just consumer-wide, about 50%, 56% adoption of uh, smartphones. But if you, if you were to look at your demographics uh, based on the research, you're probably looking more like 80%. So you got all your folks walking around with smartphones. So you know what are the implications for obviously bring things like bring your own device, and then the whole connectivity discussion we just had uh, prior around the how consumer tools work. So let's quickly take a look at you know what we can learn from some of the consumer space, and then start to apply those into um, organizations and and the discussion around the digital uh, digital workplace. So if you look at uh, one thing uh, like booking travel, for example, I mean, an organization like Hayek has taken booking flight to a new level. I mean, it not only aggregates fees from across airlines, but, but it actually makes the decision-making process easier. So in this example, you know, if you're looking to build, book a, tr a trip to London in next June, it'll give you a grid, calendar grid view of which days are the best to book. You know, it shows you the, the specific fares all the way into next year. So what if you're ready to book now? It'll tell you, you know, what are the chances fares might increase or, or decrease, let's say, in the next week. So it's not, I mean, so it's not only about just pure convenience, what that has, but it also has potential save, uh, significant savings. But the other thing that's interesting is, is it, it truly aids in decision making. So you think about this example in your own organization, you know, do you have that type of capability in, inside your organization? So that's the travel example. One other quick example is is basically paying for a parking meter, uh, and this is an example of a park mobile. And basically, you 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 eliminate the issue of digging through your your ashtrays and digging through your glove box and looking for change. So you can using this app, you can scan a barcode on the meter. You input how long you're going to be there, and then it alerts you when the meter's about to sky, about to expire. So again, you're talking convenience, cost savings, but the other thing you're talking about is also risk mitigation. Because in the past, if you uh, you know didn't have enough change, you might have run down to the CVS in the corner to get change for your ten, or you might have risked it to get a ticket. Uh, so interesting uh, way of looking at this is risk mitigation in terms of minimizing your risk of actually getting a ticket. So cost and convenience is, are key drivers as well. So one last look is at a, a service called Uber, which is basically disrupting the taxi and the cab service. So this, what they're doing is competing with the traditional cab service, so there's no more standing on the street corner in the rain trying to flag down a cab. So using the service, the driver knows where you are and comes directly to you. So the entire transaction from booking to payment is done through the app. So takeaway here is, is obviously the convenience and, and so forth, but now they've completely altered the payment process, right? So drivers don't have to carry cash, passengers don't have to carry cash. So now they've, they've, they've completely disrupted the way that not only you procure, but you pay for these things. So again, looking you know, looking at your own business, what are sort of disruptions that you see on the horizon? And then we'll talk a little bit and give a little bit more specifics around, uh, you know, the customer experience and how it ties into the digital workplace. Okay. So we, uh, so we looked at the proliferation of consumer devices and apps and what they can do, and there's two takeaways here that we want to uh, want to reinforce. The first is disruption is heading your way. So we just gave a few quick examples, and, and the, you know the demise of the BlackBerry is, is, is the most notable among them. But it really touches every in, every industry, and including our own, as being IT consultants um, in a world where our clients are procuring cloud services and so forth, and that you know that forces us to think about the way we deliver our services. So the second thing is it's all not bad news. So there is there is opportunities to radically change the customer experience. So we're going to kind of continually hit that theme as well throughout this. So you saw those examples of changing the customer experience. So what can you do inside your organization to to think about ways to, to impact that? And the final piece is people are always part of the equation. So 
they are vital to the customer experience either directly or behind the scenes. So the people component of this is, is a huge part and, and you know when we're talking about the digital workplace, you know, that's obviously our, our our focus first and foremost. The tools and information available to those folks that allow them to impact customers experience. Okay. So the um, so when we go from the consumer space into the enterprise, into companies, there's this whole notion of consumerization of IT. Taking these concepts kind of whole cloth and then applying them within an organization. So, you know, is this really the promised land and is this a really reality? And I think our point of view is, is yes, but to a certain extent. So first, we want to talk about some of the challenges and some of the myths about, you know, kind of applying the consumer technology wholesale into an organizational environment. So the first myth is, is really kind of more is better, right? I mean, it's just providing access to everything and all things and greater quantities of information and connecting everybody in the organization is going to solve the problem. Uh, oftentimes that can create yet more problems and not really address what, what you're trying to accomplish. So the key to this is understanding, you know, what is relevant to me, to my work, to my colleagues, to my customers. So relevance is, is what's often missed in this. The next one is multitasking. So you've got all these tools and technologies and your, your expectation is people are going to be, be able to do five things at once, which really go, flies in the face of you know, studies into human behavior that you can't actually do two things at once and that the constant interruptions and switching actually hinders productivity and creates stress within your organization. So the takeaway here, and we'll, we'll go into more detail later on this, is put users in control who they interface with, when, and why. So it's, it's a user control issue on that point. And then the final one is, is gets to kind of the technology selection and your potential investments in customization, whereas the conversations around more product features are better. So if we just had these 25 features or we just added these four modules, you know, th then that would, would, would address the problem. The key point here is you got to understand the context first and then determine the capabilities you need. So if you think back to the consumer examples, they all focused on a very specific problem. So Park Now didn't develop a comprehensive transportation management system. They just developed an easy way to pay for parking. So, you know, one of the other points we're going to drive home here is think about, you know, where are the, the, I don't want to say easy wins, but where are the quick wins, where are the clearly identifiable problems that you can start to design your systems around uh, to solve. Okay, so when we take a look at the digital workplace, um, we're applying some of those lessons we talked about in the consumer world, and, but really factoring in the reality and constraints of, of the workplace environment and the, the, the conditions that are specific to a workplace environment, right? So let's first start with our definition of the digital workplace. And, and you know, I, I think as you do a Google search and you find digital workplace, you'll probably see variations of this theme. I'll take you through our point of view and, and uh, you know, as hopefully we'll have a dialogue ongoing and we'd, we'd certainly love to hear kind of your point of view and your thoughts. So what we say is, is we define it as, as the uh, environment where employees are able to quickly and easily share what they know, find what they need with consistent experiences across devices and locations. So we emphasize the notion of both sharing and finding. So employees are both producers and consumers of content. The other is we also focus on the fact that employees may be physically located outside the office. They could be using multiple devices uh, to access the people and information they need to do their job. So, and then the final piece is that is the notion of consistent experiences. And this is, this is truly a, a big challenge within corporations and organizations. So, the consistent experiences gets to user experience and usability, um, which which are, are, are obviously are huge challenges, and, and but it really is something that, that needs to be tackled in, in order to 
kind of get to the promised land, if you will, with, with the digital workplace. Okay, so when we talk about beyond intranets, you know, what, what, do we, what do we really mean by this? So I thought I'd put together kind of a before and after punch list, if you will, and we talk about kind of present state and, and historically organizations that would be kind of intranet focused. Now in that, in that vein, you're really talking about both organizations that have pushed out cor corporate intranets, you know, purely for corporate communication or expanded the intranet to include collaboration uh, project sites, team sites, and things of that nature as well. So when we say kind of intranet focused, we're, we're pulling all those, those potential examples together. And then thinking about the digital workplace, so let's look at a few things. So intranet focus, focus is really kind of static intranet, and really what we're talking about the digital workplace is much more dynamically generated content, right? So the dual roles of producer and consumer of the employees internally. So traditional intranet, one-way communication, uh, more of a corp communication kind of asynchronous uh, when digital workplace is many to many. More focused on the company, so company news and information and so forth. In the digital workplace, what we're really is, is bringing the individual into it, right? So individual focus, individual control. From a monologue to a dialogue, same, uh, same thought process there. And then the internet focus, and this is, this is kind of an interesting one, is, is around feedback loops. So if you're having kind of that monologue type approach, you're not getting a whole lot of feedback and there's not an opportunity for feedback. But in digital workplace, there is constant monitoring and feedback, and we'll talk about a little bit later the, the kind of tools that can enable that. So generic to all users, contextual, and this is a big, big point that we, we drive home quite a bit is around context. So making it specific to the employee, to the user. Of course, access via PC and laptop, and now we've got multiple devices. And the next one, the email-centric, and this is a really huge one, because this, this has uh, you know, behaviors and wrapped around it in terms of the use of email for virtually everything that one would, you know, between communication, collaboration, and so forth. A lot of organizations and employees still rely heavily on email. And then, so the thinking around the digital workplace is email is one of many tools. So the idea here is let's figure out the appropriate use of email um, and, and realistically not get, a, get rid of it entirely, but what, what's the proper use of it? And there's a lot of behavioral change and, and so forth, but uh, that's a big issue. So the last one is the company in control and employee in control. So this is, this is really getting back to, you know, starting with understanding the needs, wants, desires, and, and capabilities of the employees and what's being charged of them and putting them in control of their work life, essentially. Okay, so that's kind of the before and after of the digital workplace. So next we wanted to take a look at, okay, so how are employees spending their time and how might they, and what's, what's the ideal scenario kind of going forward that this digital workplace can enable? So if you look at this chart, this is pulled from the, the McKinsey Global Institute study on, uh, on how employees uh, use their time. So if you look at the four categories so between reading and answering an email, searching and gathering information, communicating, collaborating internally, and then the last one is role-specific tasks. So if you think about it, you know, where would you want people to be spending their time, right? Well, focusing on their job and getting things done. So role-specific tasks, which according to McKinsey is about, you know, 40% of the time people spend on a given week. So when you look at the above things between reading email, searching, and communicating, collaborating internally, I mean, what you really want to think about, too, is minimizing time spent here, right? I mean, the, in, in this, where it gets back to, you know, the three myths that I put out, it, it's, it's not about having more of those things. It's about figuring out how to find the right balance between how much email, how much search, how much collaboration, so that individual can focus on their tasks. So conceptually, you can imagine this graph, you know, in a, in a digital workplace uh, context, 
you know, that 39% would be, you know, 45, 50, 60, and you'd see the ones above it shrink. So to kind of put a, uh, you know, put a, an overall objective around all of this, you know, that's, that's what we would uh, be interested in seeing. Okay, so how do we start to solve the challenges we identified, you know, with, with the overload and the proliferation of food and time wasted on people finding things? I think that there's one single concept that we can wrap around that, um, that we think is, is vitally important, and that's understanding that context is king. So, which is what we like to say around here, but really it's getting to, you know, understanding exactly why you're doing something and what are the specific needs of end users. So, what is the context in which that employee is actually operating? So, when we're talking about the context is king, we're focusing on a single employee. So, if you think about the systems that a given employee has available to them, I think a good model to start that uh, thought process is, is one that, um, uh, that Jeffrey Moore has, has been talking about uh, between the systems of record and systems of engagement. So if you think about all the systems and applications and everything else that's available within your organization, they kind of fall into two buckets. So systems of record are really kind of all your legacy systems. So that's your HR, your finance, billing, uh, perhaps your CRM system. So that's, that's all your kind of customer record information that's been in existence for quite some time. So the kind of new kid on the block is the systems of engagement, which is really things like collaboration, content management, uh, social, uh, office productivity, task management. So this is really where, if you think about it, is kind of all the unstructured content is generated and the bucket on the left there is, is more of your structured content. So if you think about an employee existing in that environment, they have to utilize both of these, these kind of system, the, both of these buckets of, of capabilities. So the important thing is in, in how you design and make these available toys, it, it's back to that context. So I'm a worker. so you know, my work is, is the context. So what are, what are the documents I need available to me? What are my tasks? What processes do I need to follow? And what data do I need to access? So the initial context is my work, right? But I also have colleagues. So what is my team? You know, what, how can I get access to them? And what do they know that I don't know that, that I can tap into them to, uh, to do what I need to do? You can also have the concept of community. So it could be outside of a purely functional team and now you're inside of a, a separate community. But within that community, you have you know, access to other members of the community and you have information needs specific to that community. So that's one context. Another context is, is my customers. So that could be either internal customers, external customers, but either way, there's expectations of me that I need to serve those customers. So I have information needs and processes and tools that I need to have. Uh, have uh, access to. So that's yet another context. And then you think about my life, right? So you, you have uh, needs, that your company is providing benefits to you and you need to understand what those benefits are. So this is, this is more of the kind of internal corporate communication context of, you know, do I have employee self-service and how easy it is is it for me to kind of access and understand my benefits and what's available to me? So kind of my, my life context, if you will. And then finally, uh, if you look at the bottom there is, is, you know, where am I located? So what is the context there? So am I a remote employee? Am I uh, on a, uh, you know, part of a sales organization where I'm on the road quite a bit? So am I outside the office? Where is my location? And what kind of devices do I have access to this environment? So all of that is, is kind of the, the individual employee inside the organization and the different types of roles that they play. And each one of those roles is going to determine what they need access to with when and how. So looking outside the organization, so now you have customers that need uh, uh, and have requirements for accessing information and stakeholders. It could be partners. It could be uh, 
um, contractors, it could be boards of directors, investors, and so forth. So again, how do they, how, what's the context there and what do they need and how do you serve them? So really, if you think about the kind of blue layer, we like to call that the context or relevancy layer, where you have to understand each of those roles in order to structure the tools and information and make them uh, these folks more effective at doing their jobs. So there's an integration challenge, which is how do you bring these together, the systems of engagement and the systems, in, uh, systems of record. And of course, there's an access challenge, right? So we've got people outside the organization that are either part of the organization or you know, maybe the external customers or stakeholders. So how do you get them into the environment? So the nice thing about kind of starting with context is it tends to lead to asking the right questions and challenging this. So the, the really what it does is it helps to focus on the essential problem that's being solved and specific capabilities and information needs for each of these contexts or, or roles. It, can, it all can help you organize and prioritize your roadmap and identify potential pilot opportunities. So if you think about each one of these contexts and, and you know, how do I get started, it's a big, huge mess. You know, think about isolating each of those, one of those use cases or contexts and building a pilot around it. So in the, in the, for example, in the, in the software development world, there's this concept of an MVP, a minimum viable product. So where you find a discrete use case, you design the minimum viable product, so the, the, the absolute minimum product set to meet that need, and then you test and, and iterate from that point. So one way to think about you know, how to tackle this, this problem um, using, using kind of context as your, as your guiding point. Okay, so if you think about what problem we're really trying to solve when we implement these tools, one would be reducing friction, right? So the communication channels throughout the organization between teams and organizations to the individual, you know, how do you reduce that friction? So that's, that's one objective. And the other is reducing noise. So the individual accessing information, how easy is it to find, how easy is it to reuse, and that really, the notion of findability is absolutely paramount, and that's, that's kind of a key principle of, of looking at and, and understanding what's different about a, a true digital workplace. So we've talked about kind of context, and we look at it, how it kind of plays out in an organization, and then now we're going to go start to talk about the specific tools. So if, if um, and then the kind of categories of things that you need to think about in order to uh, start to enable the, the uh, digital workplace. So there's a boil down to a couple of things um, that we, uh, or actually four things that we uh, advocate in terms of elements of the digital workplace. So the first thing is communication. So this is gets at specifically kind of addressing the corporate communication and, and the function of the traditional corporate intranet but applying it in, in the digital workplace concept of, and, and we'll talk a little bit how that might be different. The other is content. So we talked about you know, how content is stored and accessed and, and what's, what's going to be uh, required in the digital workplace. And then the other thing is collaboration. So, the, so how do individuals operate and, and communicate with each other? And then of course the last thing we talked about was context. Which, uh, which is a critical thing. So let's take a look at how these, these four elements kind of play out in an organization and what are the, the kind of key takeaways from a, from a uh, solution perspective that, that you would need to start thinking about. So if you start kind of at the top of the organization and, and think about you know, leadership, what they need to do in terms of communication to the organization, so things like mission, values, culture, vision, and so forth are really communicated to the masses, right? And this is this is kind of the traditional role of the uh, of the corporate intranet. But beyond that, you obviously have people operating in teams. So how do you enable the communication and, and collaboration in this particular case between the teams? So how how easy and simple is that process? And when you isolate on a specific individual among a team, so what are they charged with and what is the context of that individual? Well, they're, they're interfacing with the customers, constituents uh, that they need to serve. 
So if you think about what that really means, it means meeting expectations, right? So I need to know who the customer is, what their expectations, and it could be a variety of things that they value. You know, our clients really value responsiveness. So as you think about that and those expectations on that employee, then that creates a situation where that employee needs to be able to tap into all the resources of the organization and be able to, in this case, let's focus on responsiveness, be incredibly responsive. So really, if you think about all this communication, the collaboration uh, really resides in, 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 a, in a particular content store or, or multiple content stores. So you're looking at documents, data, sites, tasks, videos, conversations. So really, again, getting back to the notion of reducing friction, reducing noise, you know, now that employee has to be able to tap back into that whole content store. So what are they looking, looking to do? I mean, they're, they're basically looking to be able to quickly find and share information out of that store that may have been a conversation, that may have been a, a corporate communication, that may have been, you know, a marketing piece from uh, a collateral piece from sales and marketing. So the idea is you start to put the individual in control and understand you know, who they are, what their needs are, and really look to put that control in, into the employee's hands. So if you look at the four components, the content, collaboration, communication, and context, I mean, focusing on the center bucket, so content really is about addressing information architecture, metadata. So getting at the, the issue of how findable are things. And then for the collaboration piece, the implications are you know, uh, deeper user profiles to identify the right people. And also search to, to find prior conversations, right? And then for the communication piece, which would seemingly be kind of you know, the, the mundane uh, aspect to this, but really there's opportunities to use channels and, and, and the specific medium depending on the objectives. So there you know, could be your standard corporate blogs, but the use of things like video to communicate, communicate organization-wide, use of video conferencing, and also the idea of news feeds uh, really gives you an opportunity to, to do things like reinforce the behavior of communicate outside of email. So that's where you have an opportunity to do that. And then finally, to address the, the issue of information overload, you, look, you can look what actually can be done when you think about something like um, uh, in the SharePoint world, my sites. So if you look at the big uh, employee uh, icon there and you imagine that his or her view and access into the rest of that organization is through, let's say, a my site and where they have complete control over that information from aggregated news feeds to consolidated task lists, to documents that they're currently working on, things of that nature, you really start to get to the whole notion of the employees in control of that information flow. And then that starts to get to the addressing the, the overload and the relevancy um, that, that really is, is, is a challenge in terms of you know, truly getting to uh, to what we consider to be a bona fide digital workplace. So that's uh, kind of a, a, an organizational look uh, at how it might work. So really, if you think about, you know, let's say you, you did realize this digital workplace and you had all the right tools and processes and everybody's happy, um, you know, so what, what is really the, the, the upside or the impact for this? So if you look at the reality of, of corporate America right now, and this is a study around that is done every year by Gallup on the state of the uh, American workplace, where they look at three categories of things. Are employees engaged? Are they not engaged? Or are they actively disengaged? And the results are, are surprisingly consistent every year, and this is from the 2013 study, that 70% are either not engaged or actively disengaged. So. One of the things you're thinking about that, that, that we talk about and kind of advocate is, is, you know, this whole notion of the digital workplace obviously cannot solve 
all the issues that are that are kind of part and parcel of, of, of this disengagement problem. But there are specific elements if you start to kind of unpack the research a little bit and pull out elements of that that where it could have an impact. And it, it, we think it's an important place to, to start to think about and also start to build the business case for for going in, in this particular direction. So what are some of the criteria? So when you look at uh, employee engagement, so availability of resources to perform well. So obviously that could have an impact there. Freedom from ob obstacles to, to success at work. Uh, and obviously the whole notion of knocking down obstacles is is as you roll out tools and as you as you put these things out there, you know, are you really knocking down obstacles or are you creating more? So ability to meet work challenges effectively, it's pretty straightforward. I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work. That's that's obviously a direct impact and and, and could be significantly uh, you know impacted by the digital workplace. The, the, the last couple ones are really around corporate communication and this is getting back to that whole notion of feedback loops and, and being able to tap into and understand how people are feeling and, and their impressions of, of how things are going. So at work my opinions seem to count. So can you help to understand and abstract that? And the final one is the mission or purpose of the company makes me feel my job is important. So that gets to culture and, and how you reinforce the culture and, and consistently communicate uh, and reinforce that. So this looks at employee engagement and, and potential wins that you know you might be able to experience in looking at the uh, digital workplace. So next we're going to turn to actual business impact. So there's a variety of areas and, and this is typically where if you've uh, you know been involved in implementing SharePoint or any other collaboration or content management system, you know, the, the metrics and the rationale for implementing this have been uh, fairly soft. So in other words, you know, it's been collaboration for collaboration's sake. So the, but there are some real business impacts and these these could form start to form the basis of your business case. So obviously the first one, improved communication, reinforcement of culture, it is a little softer but but still important. Absent absenteeism, staff turnover. So uh, you know, clear potential for there when you get the employee engagement challenge right. Improved employee experience, productivity, greater innovation. So that's part and parcel of you know if if you if you do this right and you have folks that are spending more time focused on their job, you're probably likely you know more than likely to to actually start to get greater innovation rather than people just uh, running through their tasks on a daily basis. So other interesting ones are real estate costs, travel expenses, environmental gains. gains. So if you have uh, you know, flexible policies like we do here, uh, we've seen organizations where the actual required square footage for a given employee population is, is, is shrunken. So there's real potential hard dollar gains there. And last one is improved customer experience, retention, and profitability. So that gets to, you know, happy people being able to serve customers uh, more effectively and, and the customers stick around and, and uh, tend to uh, buy more, more, of your, more of your services. So that's, I uh, just wanted to give you kind of a quick framework that you might be able to use in building your own ROI. So I think, you know, all of those may not be applicable to, you know, your organization, but I think there's an opportunity to kind of pick out a few that, that actually make sense for you. So I wanted to turn attention to kind of how do you get it done. So the uh, we we basically put together a, a kind of a five-step process that we think is a good and solid way to uh, to start to tackle this issue. Uh, so I'll take you through some of the steps, um, and then at the tail end there's a there's an offer for a workshop that um, we can uh, you know more or less use this as a starting point for to dig in a little bit deeper with your organization. So the first thing we talk about is clarifying the context. So if you think back to that uh, graphic I put on there and all the different uh, little, little figures throughout the organization, you know, the first place we like to start is, is, is understanding where we're going to start. So clarify the context. What are you trying to accomplish? Who's being impacted and so forth? And part parcel of that is focus on users, right? So uh, understand their information needs 
uh, what problems are they trying to solve, and, and focus intently on users. And uh, you know what we typically use is more of a human uh, human centered design process. Uh, and again, that could be a whole separate conversation, obviously, but uh, focusing on the users is critical. The next is, is spec out a game plan. So this is really about starting with a roadmap. And the, and the thing here is, when you spec out a game plan, it doesn't have to be carved in stone. I mean, it, with all of these things, what you're doing is making assumptions, and then in the execution, typically in a pilot form, you are testing those assumptions and learning. So specking out a game plan, here's, here's the roadmap as we see it right now, and here's why. Get executive buy-in but also building these things where you get feedback and, and so forth, which leads to the next one, which is the process of rolling out. So what we like to advocate is, is more around experiment, measure, and learn. So you know, where could we start with a pilot program? Uh, test out some of these features of uh, you know, news feeds within a My Site that's got custom uh, task lists and you know, whatever, whatever it is you might want to uh, test out. Maybe it's an extranet focused on a specific client or set of clients. Um, so you know, build, build, build some boundaries around what you're trying to do, but make sure you can experiment, measure, and learn from it. And then to the extent you've done one or more of these, or maybe just one is sufficient depending on the scope of your organization, you know, roll out and support. And one of the critical things here around the rollout and support that we've seen work is, is number one, don't underestimate the change management uh, aspect to this. You know, I talked about how easy consumer tools were adopted in the organization, but, the, but this particular issue is where, you know, realistically in a corporate environment, it's a little bit more difficult than that. So what we've seen work in this particular context is treated as, literally as, as more or less a product rollout. So you have a communications plan, you have change management plan, and then also you have both technical and subject matter resources available uh, whenever users run into a challenge or a problem. And of course, the way you've structured this rollout is, is informed by that pilot and what you learned previously. So what the thing you don't want to do is, 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 you, is you want to nip in the bud any user frustration uh, as soon as it happens because a lot of times, as many of you I'm sure you know, you only get one bite at the apple. So that's rollout support, which is really, really critical. And okay, so that's that's kind of the five-step process that that we've seen kind of work. And there's aspects to it that are informed by um, both kind of design thinking, as as I mentioned, as well as as human-centered design. So love to to chat with you more about that. We obviously don't have enough time uh, in this session to go into detail on it. But uh, we think it's a process that's uh, much, much higher likelihood of actually achieving user adoption and, and, and business outcomes. Okay, so we've talked, you know, kind of theoretically about a lot of things and, and conceptually about this process and so forth. So I thought I'd end with, uh, you know, a specific example that we've kind of used this process on ourselves. So if you think about, you know, we talked about context and the customer experience and so forth. So we started with, um, you know, how can we improve Portal Solutions, you know, our customer experience and what specific things can we focus on? So we're a project-based business and we focus in, uh, you know, obviously the, one of the biggest challenges with projects is communication. So we thought about, you know, how can we improve the communication with the client so there's always, you know, expectations are matched and there's always communication going by the client. So we built on SharePoint 2013 a custom um, customer extranet that included things like uh, customers can use their own uh, social credentials like LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, Microsoft Live ID to actually access our environment. So we don't have the user management hassle and customers don't have to create another login. We have things like auto site provisioner that would have when you provision a new, you know, one-click site provisioning for a new project site that has all the templates and documents and metadata and so forth. Um, we also have access to case studies, blogs, news events, so kind of all of our corporate information is available to our customers through this. And then a whole series of uh, deliverable tracking, status reports, and, and et cetera. So the real motivation here was, you know, 
address the customer experience, you know, pick a specific use case, because we, when we kind of brainstormed around this, we came up with probably 20 or 30 things we could do. But we wanted to focus in on, on something that's going to have a, a significant impact and came up with the corporate extranet or, or the, our customer extranet. And uh, so we think that and already have started to receive good, good feedback on this. And then looking forward, we also developed a roadmap. So on the roadmap, our next uh, set of enhancements are around uh, addressing task management. So if, you, if you've looked at SharePoint 2013, there's really some interesting and nice visualizations and so forth and uh, a way of handling task management. But we, we are going to take that a little uh, one step further uh, and, and start to develop some interesting uh, solutions around task management in the context of SharePoint. So I wanted to just leave you with um, that we do, in fact, eat our own dog food. And just a real specific example of everything we talked about here uh, in the digital workplace as, as, a, uh, as a real uh, bona fide solution. So the, the final takeaway on this is if you can imagine, so now with this extranet, you know, our clients can be sitting with their tablet or their smartphone in a meeting, get questioned by their boss, how's that SharePoint project going? They can immediately pull up the extranet, log in with their own credentials, see the latest status report, see the task list and the tracking, and be able to be informed, uh, you know, immediately up to date without having to pick up the phone and call us. So that's kind of the change in experience that, that we, uh, we see for ourselves. So that is the uh, conclusion of the formal part of our program here. Um, so there are a couple of questions that I'll, I'll uh, grab real quick that have come in. And um, let's see, Jenny, where? Okay, so here's one. How do we get through the noise to the content that really matters? So that's a great question, and really that gets to um, the issue of, of a big part of that is metadata. So essentially, you know, how can we get to a point where, you know, the content uh, essentially kind of identifies itself, right? So imagine, you know, the content had little RFID tags and, you, you know, can broadcast where it is and what it is. Uh, so that kind of is kind of where metadata gets. So it's metadata. And then there's lots and lots of different ways to try to either automatically tag data, tag data when it's it's entered into uh, or loaded up into a site, or um, you know tools to to uh, to auto tag. The other flip side of that is search. So implementing a real bona fide enterprise search that goes across not only the the uh, the documents, let's say, but also conversations, uh, videos, people. So a huge, huge issue is enterprise search. So in terms of setting priorities, in terms of your kind of roadmap, search has got to be at or near the top of the list. So that, that helps get through the noise issue. Let me grab another one before we hit the top of the hour. So the, the other one is, with so many different communication systems, how do you ensure people see your message? I think there's one is, um, you know, getting to this whole concept of, you know, my site, a personal site, uh, and if you think about the way people consume information, you know, either in their Facebook or so forth, is, is you know, understanding how to reach people. Number one, allowing them to have those personal sites where they can organize the information, and then targeting the the type of inf information to uh, the intent of the message. So, the idea is, how can you and news feeds would be a perfect example of this. So a lot of times we use, um, if you if you think about kind of status reports that are produced on a consistent basis, a lot of what we started doing internally here is using news feeds to provide quick status updates, and then aggregating you you know kind of and then being able to control and aggregate your news feeds. I could get an ad, you know an abstract uh, every morning in my inbox. And really what it allows to do is rather than digging through emails, you dig through your news feed and you can get very quick status updates that can be kind of automatically triggered or, or of course, uh, the status provider puts it in a news feed. So I think a news feeds really kind of change the game in terms of, of um, communication and then start to pull some of these types of things like status updates 
out of your email box. So I think um, we're right at the top of the hour. I want to thank everybody for participating today. I put some contact informa information up on this last slide. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you and keep the conversation going. Is, is obviously this whole notion of digital workplace is, is, a, is an emerging, uh, emerging uh, phenomenon, if you will. Yeah, so let, let's keep the dialogue going. The other thing, just uh, wanted to give you a heads up, we have a, uh, a webinar on, on Thursday, November 19th, so SharePoint migration, to be or not to be in the cloud. So big issue around what's the right, what's the right choice for me in terms of cloud, on-prem, or, or some hybrid thereof. So uh, webinar Thursday, the November 19th, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, any other information about Portal, you can hit our website, portalsolutions.net. And uh, once again, thanks for joining us today and, and have a great day.